I'm, I'm dean of this new school, so before I speak, let me share with, with, with you the, uh, um, the, our new logo of the school. Um, uh, look, it's terrific having you here on, on Saturday morning. Uh, had a uh, presentation yesterday at Gowling's down, downtown. It was at 7 in the morning, 7.30 in the morning. So, and a little, quite a few people came as well. So, uh, so I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you're interested in, in uh, subjects related to academia and to research. And perhaps a little bit about space that I'm going to, uh, to, to talk about. Uh, it's a distinguished crowd. Let me... Uh, acknowledge uh, um, a friend and somebody who actually uh, started it all, the York, uh, the York Circle series, and it is uh, uh, Miki Ko, and together with Judy, uh, they started it uh, several years ago, four years ago, perhaps. About four years, About four years ago. So uh, th thank, thank you so much, this is Miki. <laughs> Look, indeed, let, I, I want to tell, share with you uh, some of my experiences uh, the, when I went to on a series of parabolic flights uh, in space. Uh, technically, I have to tell you from, uh, from the beginning that it, it was almost space. We were at around 32, 34 kilometers. Sp space starts from uh, maybe around 40. But uh, it, it's uh, already you can see a, a, a curvature of the earth and, and, the, uh, and you can see that everything above you is totally pitch black. Uh, and I, I'll tell you about some other experiences as well. But before I do so, uh, let, let me just uh, start with uh, uh, this slide, which is, uh, let me share with you how I see uh, the, the frontiers in science. And in fact, uh, by the way, I may be totally wrong. It's just my, uh, my opinion, and I, I would need your, a bit of your f uh, feedback. So I believe that uh, one of the frontiers in science, something that is uh, um, unexplored to a, a great uh, degree, it is still universe. So that's why I'm very much interested in uh, in, in uh, space exploration, particularly I'm interested in Mars. Uh, the other area, in my opinion, is uh, human brain. We are making uh, substantial progress, but there is still quite a lot to um, explore. Another area that is a bit controversial, perhaps, it, I believe it is the energy, particularly with the focus on, on f fusion, when why energy? Because we need to have one in order to sustain life and we need to make sure that if we are going to do so, it will be done uh, in a way that it's not going to uh, impact in a negative way uh, the environment. Uh, well, so uh, those are the three that I believe are important. Now, what is it that you believe? Uh, I see, I see quite, uh, quite a few of you that work in science. So I, in fact, I'm very much interested in, in, in your opinion. Um, and uh, I, I'm Going to, uh, d John, what do you think? John, John McDermott, Professor McDermott, he, John is going to speak in the afternoon. I didn't check with him, by the way. So it, <laughs> it, is, it is totally ad hoc, uh, but I'm sure that he will. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, I would have to say, given, given my uh, druthers, that I would say, how do we create a living, walking, thinking human being from a, a single fertilized egg? Ah, that's a challenge. Uh, that, that's a challenge. It's uh, perhaps a frontier as well. Yes, that's. Uh, and um, anyone else, uh, Terry? What, 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 what's your? What do you think? Terry is visiting us from uh, uh, McMaster University. Well, I, I think um, I think uh, solving the big problems of cancer. I think uh, that's definitely a frontier. Cancer, I would totally agree. In fact, I was thinking about putting it here, but I didn't want to preempt it. Uh, and, 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 and again, it's an ad hoc answer. We never spoke about it. Any, anyone else do you, has a different idea? Please go ahead, and then you. Brilliant. In fact, when I joined York back in 10, 2010, 
I wanted to hire an astro-nanobiologist. I was told that we don't have one at the moment. <laughs> Perhaps now we, we, we might. Uh, so absolutely, totally, go, please. That is true. Well, what uh, you're, you're right about it. Um, and perhaps uh, in a year's time or, or so, in two years' time, when we are going to have a new uh, building for the Lasson School, we will be happy to organize one of these events and speak about uh, the necessity of uh, partnering between academia, industry, but government, and likely a the business community and so on. It's the, the sort of uh, public, private partnerships that are going to be one of the driving forces. And it's very likely that Pina is going to talk about it this afternoon. So uh, look, what, what, it, what it tells you is that uh, I, I like the fact that there is a variety of opinions uh, and suggestions. And that's how science is being done. Uh, science is, is progressing uh, because uh, uh, we have uh, m many different ideas, and, and uh, on campus we typically argue with one another about who is right. It is likely that most of us are, are right, and it's, you never know where the breakthrough is going to come. So you have to do many t different things at the same time. So what, what I did when I was a bit younger, I, I did uh, decide to uh, study what is it out there on um, Mars and perhaps other planets. How, how can we benefit from knowledge that we have about these planets? There's a lot of work that is being done about Mars exploration. I'm sure you've heard about uh, rovers. And in Europe, it was, Beagle was a big uh, adventure. And, uh, and, and recently, NASA um, in fact, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they successfully sent uh, a, uh, a discovery uh, to uh, Mars that landed. Uh, there, there is a problem, however, with rov rovers because they, their uh, lifespan is uh, limited. We'll see how about we'll see if uh, Discovery is going to, to be able to to, to break the uh, barrier of just a couple of kilometers exploration, but. Even discovery is not able to do uh, one thing that is very difficult, to go there and bring a real sample from Mars. We don't have one right now. The reality is we, th there are some uh, suggestions that there are pieces of, of Mars that landed on, on Earth some time ago, but we never were able to go out there, land, collect samples, and then come back onto the Earth. Well, why so? Because with the technology that we currently have, we would need to have so much fuel on board that we would not be able to uh, have a takeoff of the, uh, of, of, uh, the, uh, the, the, the rocket. So, uh, so we have to find different ideas. Now, one idea uh, that NASA actually uh, implemented is to use nuclear energy. It's a very good idea, by the way, and you can, you can do it. The problem that NASA experienced was that uh, um, uh, different legal organizations uh, uh, took NASA to court. They say that, look, if you go to space, then, then of course, you're going to, and using nuclear energy, you're going to generate quite a lot of uh, nuclear waste. And then it will be disposed of in space. And you can't do it. Space belongs to uh, um, uh, everybody at the moment. It has not been divided yet. So the technology is very good. I've seen it, in fact. Um, but And NASA is unable to do anything about it because they are still tied up in courts. Well, I, I see a few lawyers here, so you know uh, that uh, once our friends from, from the legal profession get into a uh, business of science, it, it, it may take quite a long time until this is going to be cleared out. Uh, uh, so, well, by the way, so it's too bad for science. It's really good for us. Because what we did, when I say we, 
in Canada with the Canadian Space Agency, we, uh, agency, we created a partnership with uh, ESA, European Space Agency. And our approach was, was different. Rather than using nuclear energy, let's see if there is an alternative. And in fact, the idea that we had was to go there. Because going uh, to Mars, it's not a problem. Landing, not a problem. Uh, but then you have to sustain your activities on Mars. So we decided to use energy resources on Mars. Well, there are only two, in fact. It's uh, aluminum and magnesium. Those are metals. And uh, there it, it is at least 10 times more aluminum and magnesium on Mars than, than onto the Earth. Now, uh, in fact, uh, what I wanted to do is bring some powdered aluminum here and uh, show you others. I would throw it up the air. It would burn like hell. It would generate more energy. The unit of magnesium generates more energy than the unit of hydrogen. So it's very powerful. By the way, so I was not allowed because of some. <laughs> safety regulations and since as dean I'm one of the uh, key safety officers on campus then I, I, I can't overrule myself. So, uh, so but nevertheless, uh, but the problem of course is that on Mars, here it would, it would work beautifully because if you mix aluminum with powdered aluminum or magnesium with, with uh, air it works perfect. Well the problem of course is that there's no air on Mars. Mars, 95% of the Martian atmosphere is CO2. CO2 is not a very good oxidizer, of course, because it's a very stable molecule. So uh, uh, it's a very stable substance, in fact. So uh, what, uh, what we decided to do is to see what are the necessary conditions in order to take uh, aluminum or magnesium from the Martian crust and mix it with CO2 from the Martian atmosphere in order to initiate uh, ignition. Once you ignite them, then it, they will be able to sustain the uh, process. So that's what, that's what our, idea, uh, our idea was, to, to, uti to, to have this in situ in utilizing uh, in situ uh, uh, resources that are available on Mars, ignite it and burn it in order to generate enough energy so you can have a takeoff of your rover or whatever other device you're going to use from Mars, get onto the orbit and then go back onto the Earth. So we, we've proposed several ideas and uh, what we uh, did is we, we wanted to test it. And testing it in, in the laboratory, it, it's got some limitations. All of us that, that work in, in the lab, uh, you know that we are trying to mimic uh, the real life situations, or, or in this case, uh, real life on Mars situations, perhaps. Um, so that, what we did is we proposed this idea to uh, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, and we we, we said that what we would like to do is we would like to test it on a series of those uh, the zero gravity flights. So let me tell you, it's not easy, by the way, to, to get there. It's, those flights are organized twice a year. There are only maximum seven, five to seven experiments per, uh, uh, per flight. The flight is around uh, three million euros. It's, it's an expensive proposition, so it's highly competitive. Um, so a colleague of mine from France and another one from Japan and uh, myself, we, we, we felt that we have a good enough idea that we, we competed and we got acceptance. And then you have to go through a series of really um, uh, medical checkups and, uh, uh, and they would test uh, if you can actually, uh, uh, how long you can s sustain if you are uh, if your head is down and, and, and the legs up and after eating and drinking a lot and, and so on. Those are the parabolic, so we got it and we, we got it on those parabolic flights. Parabolic flights are interesting. What you do essentially is you, it, it is a, uh, a, a, a 
almost regular aircraft, in our case it was an Airbus 300, and it is a little wider. And if, if you see, it's all foamed around, well, because you will be hitting your, your head over everything around. And then, so those are the experimental stations. I'll show you ours later on. And you, ha you have to really have every screw, everything has to be really well tied because otherwise it will be all floating. So how it works is that you go up to, uh, in our case, it's almost 32 kilometers. And when you go up, you are at up to four gravity forces. Now, what does it mean? You can't move your leg whatsoever. It's so heavy. And blinking an eye is very, very difficult. You can't do much about it. You are just like pinned to the, to the ground. And then, uh, and then when you reach the altitude, they say five, four, three, two, one, release. They switch engines off. And you are falling down to approximately five kilometers. So of course, and then depending on the trajectory, um, you you stay um, you stay at this state uh, for in our case up to maybe 80 seconds maybe a little bit longer depending on how long other experiments need to uh, last. So uh, of course, since the uh, weight of the uh, aircraft is much much heavier than the weight of your body, you are at zero gravity. So what it means, you're floating, really floating. And then what's, what's happening is that when you reach the uh, five kilometers, engines are put back on and you're up again. Up and down. We, and and we, we did it 28 times. <laughs> you see, because you have to have some repeatability in your experiments and also you have to have at least a, a bit of fun. So at least two parables are... <laughs> so uh, what's happening is that your stomach is trying to jump out uh, this way <laughs> or the other way. And, 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 uh, and of course, by the way, the, the, the zero gravity flights sometimes, uh, the, these aircrafts are called uh, a, a vomit comet. <laughs> and and it, 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 it is true. Uh, I'm not going, uh, well, there was a story that I used to tell in the past about my friend from Japan who, who, who was uh, unable to, to continue after just a couple of, uh, uh, of those uh, the parables, but, but he asked me not to uh, say these things anymore, so I, I will not. <laughs> let, let me just, uh, but i tell you some other things, perhaps. So, uh, uh, look, be, maybe be, before I show you some of those slides, uh, what it is, on one of the parables, I really, I wanted to, to see how it looks like from the cockpit, and you have, uh, an astronaut that is the captain of of this uh, um, uh, of this unit. So I went there, and it is it's absolutely beautiful. You, you see, because you truly see uh, the, the, the Earth, and it's so quiet. I, I mean, it's a cliche, perhaps, what I'm saying, but but that, that's exactly how you feel it. You so so f much freedom. I mean, you can you you're empowered. You. You think that you can do everything. Well, then you go back and do your experiments, and as always with experiments, some of them are going to work, but some or most of them will not. Uh, but, but when I was there, and then when you are falling down, and if you are at, uh, well, 20 or 15, it's, it's still beautiful, but once you are at uh, 7 and 6 and 5, uh, and, you, and your engines, are silent. It's a bit. Uh, uh, you, 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 you feel uh, you feel some anxiety. I'd, I'd say, and essentially, you see, five kilometers is just a matter of uh, a couple of seconds. So if your if, if your engines are not working, then then it, it is tricky. It would be very very difficult. Um, well, it never happened, no, nothing ever happened, uh, because the, it, there are four engines, so you, you always have a backup and, and so on. Look, so this is, so what we did, we went on that flight, um, had, we had lots of fun, and, but we believe that we've done some good science as well, to the point that uh, at the end, uh, ESA decided to design a, uh, 
a rover. And, the, and they expanded our idea, I have to say, but, but nevertheless, the, fund, the foundation was there and it is very likely that in 2018 we may have a uh, rover uh, using this idea uh, being sent to Mars and uh, very likely by 2029 they plan to have a human being to, to, be, to be there. Uh, ju just f uh, just uh, uh, as a matter of principle, I signed up for this mission in 2029. <laughs> I'll be long retired from the university, so they are not going to consider me, but, but it is important to, to participate. Look, so this is how it looks like in, inside. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, experiments, by the way, so what we did, um, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to talk too much about science, and there's just maybe a, a graph or two to illustrate what we, what we did, um, or maybe three. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what we wanted to do is truly mimic conditions that uh, exist on Mars, and then uh, find what are the necessary conditions in order to have this uh, aluminum from Martian crust and mixing it with CO2, how we can initiate uh, and sustain the combustion process so to generate enough energy for the process. So uh, look, it's a lot of good, uh, good work. Uh, you can see it, it was before I was the dean and didn't have, a, didn't have a silver hair on the side and so on. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't need to worry if we have a, a, a chalk in the, uh, in, in, in the classroom somewhere in the corner, uh, uh, as I do right now. So, uh, but, but it, it is truly, well, well the, you can see this is how it looks like when we, when we go up. Oh, by the way, one thing that, we, that I, should have, I should mention, I have this so I can, I can show you. Look, uh, so we, we, we had some bottles of water and we, on purpose we would make uh, holes in it so droplets would float and you would chase it in, in the air. It was, it was so terrific. <laughs> But at the end, you, you have to do some science, which we, we, which we, which we did. So, um, look, about the science, let me give you an introduction, because it, it, you see, the idea was to check what, what are the, uh, um, essentially, what is the size of the particle that you have to have in order to initiate uh, the, the process. So, um, we tested a variety of particles, small, very small, small and then larger and so on, um, and we found out, let me tell you, that you have to have a very small particle, a nano particle of aluminum or magnesium in order to be successful. So let's see what's the difference between nano and micro. This is, by the way, uh, aluminum. So aluminum, micron size aluminum, it looks, uh, it looks totally different than the nano size. This, one, then this aluminum looks like perhaps a carbon or soot, black. Stuff. But just to give you an example, the difference between around 40 nano and 1 micron is substantial, tremendous. Now then, if so if you take a picture of micron and nano, they look different. But the key is not how they look like. The key, uh, in our case, it was something that is called a surface area. Well, in other words, it is uh, per unit um, mass of, um, of, of your material, how much surface you're going to have available for chemical reactions. So for nanoparticles, uh, there is a very high ratio between surface area and volume. So what does it mean? There's, if you have a much bigger surface area, it means that if you, if, if you send the CO2 there, there will be more and more and more oxygen, so the concentration is going to be as high that at some point it, will, it may trigger an auto-ignition. So uh, that, that's what we did. We experimented with uh, micron size and nano size of particles, and what we wanted to do is find uh, optimal conditions. So I, I will show you a, a, the, some of our results, but uh, just a reference. When you see N38, that it means that uh, it, ref, it, it corresponds to our experiments with particles with uh, almost 40 
nanometers in diameter. And I, I think I selected only this one and that one. Micron or U11 means that uh, the average size was of the particle was around 11 micron, a substantial difference. As you saw the other image, then there was a substantial difference between them. Uh, it means that uh, there is some different uh, metal content, but it's not that important. The important thing is to see how quickly you can initiate this process and how quickly you can uh, accomplish it. The sooner you initiate, the better because it will cost you less energy. The, 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 uh, the sooner you complete, the better, because the unit energy that is stored in, in aluminum is going to be utilized um, within a much shorter period of time. So you can have a spike in energy that you can, you can channel to uh, the rover and then take uh, off. Now, what we did is we did utilize several different units. One, let me share with you. Uh, this is something called a diamond anvil cell. Uh, physicists are using it. Do we have physicists today with us? Well, physicists use these units. Well, if not, then, then, uh, then, then I don't need to be too scientific. I can, <laughs> because physicists would correct me. Uh, look, the size of it is like a puck, hockey puck. So it's a small, very small size. The, 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 the real reaction is taking place here. So you will see what, what I mean. Those are two diamonds of a high quality, by the way. So we have uh, this one diamond covered with uh, a bit of a gasket just to, just to seal it. And there, there is an uh, opening. It's, it's a reaction chamber where we put our samples, whatever we want. So aluminum, magnesium, or some other metallic fuels. And then we would add uh, a variety of media, such as CO2. We, we experimented also with uh, H2O, supercritical water, because what we wanted to do at the same time, I didn't mention it, we wanted to use this supercritical water to uh, decompose organic waste that is generated mostly by uh, astronauts when they go and leave on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the uh, space station. We all generate lots of organic wastes, <laughs> by the way. So, but but we, we have other systems that take care of it. But in the space is different. So then we have uh, uh, another, uh, an, another uh, the diamond. Everything is heated in order because we want to control the, temp uh, the, the process very well. Everything is very nicely covered. And I tell you, we have to do it because uh, um, once when we did this experiment uh, uh, on Earth in the lab, one of my postdocs forgot to attach uh, correctly one of the 12 screws. And then the top diamond, top cover, uh, went, uh, it, it exploded. So it, it went through the lab. Then made a hole in the wall, went through the corridor, and made a hole in the next one. Well, we were doing some experiments with um, oxygen and hydrogen, so it's, it's, a, it's an explosive. Um, and so you have to be very, very careful. Now, then what you do is you want to control your process as much as you can. So a controlling process, it's, in this case, it's mostly temperature, pressure, maybe concentration. So we, we do have some thermocouples. Uh, that are used to measure temperature. But uh, and then what we would do is protect uh, the diamonds a little bit from oxidation so we can see it very nicely. Then we would put the entire thing under a microscope. So we would be able to see what is happening in there. Now, and then, but seeing is not good enough because we have to know what's happening, what kind of chemical reactions are occurring, and what is the outcome of the process. Then we would use a variety of microscopes, one, uh, or, or in fact, uh, wavelengths. Uh, the, uh, one of them, Raman, was very, very useful. So what we would do is we would then flush a Raman, put it in the Raman microscope, and we would take, we would take spectra. So we would be able to not only see, but measure. If you measure something, then you are able to optimize 
your conditions and, and uh, change this and change that and, and test it. So that's what, uh, that's what we, we had done. We also um, wanted to understand a little bit more about uh, um, uh, the potential conditions on, on other planets. So in, we, we simulated, we had a r r Ruby to give us some information about in the interior. Uh, and then we would use uh, lasers to uh, ignite aluminum, magnesium, and then study their uh, performance. But uh, what we wanted to do is also monitor the pressure, because if you have too high a pressure, uh, then, uh, uh, then it, it's becoming uh, very dangerous. In, in fact, this unit can sustain up to, I think, around uh, four gigapascals, and uh, the if you have, uh, the, there was the, in the Nagasaki, I think, when uh, the atomic bomb was exploded, the pressure w was uh, twice as low as the one that you can achieve here. So you have to be very, very careful. Uh, so what we do is we, we control pressure via the, the, the small ruby um, the stone. Uh, the, so we, we flash uh, continuously, we excite. The, uh, the, the, the ruby, um, uh, and then ruby would react to it the way that it would fluoresce, and then we would measure the change in the wavelength, in the fluorescent, and then we would know that the change of one angstrom, one angstrom is 10 to the minus 10. So it's, uh, it's like if you had a hair and then divided it into 10,000 pieces, then one of those pieces would be one angstrom. Uh, and then, uh, so we, we would measure it and then we would be able to know what is the temperature. So it, it just, it tells you why I'm showing it. Uh, I wanted to show you that, um, that we've done experiments at more so at a fundamental level, very, very small, not, not, not a large uh, the unit. Um, uh, so always there is a question if you do experiments at a small, um, at a small uh, level, is it, is it possible to scale it up? Since then, we've done it, by the way, it was back in 2003, 10 years ago. So we've, we've, uh, we were able to scale it up later on. At the same time, that was something I wanted to share with you because I like it. I like the story. Well, you see, at the same time, you, when you do those experiments and when you have those harsh conditions and, and when you build your rovers, typically we use a very uh, expensive and exotic materials. So we came up with one of those exotic materials. It's called erbium-based. Erbium is not a very known metal. We know about uh, lead, cadmium, uranium, carbon, and all. But erbium is not very common. So we, we were able to do it. It's a very interesting um, uh, metal because uh, what you can do, and we hope that erbium actually may be able to be mixed with aluminum and magnesium. But um, what's beautiful about erbium is that at these conditions, you can change the uh, uh, nature or geometry of erbium, um, in this case, hydroxides, in a variety of ways. So you may have those flowers or microflowers. You can have a different kind of there. You can have fibers, what it means that flexibility, it offers you a lot of opportunities to utilize it for different um, types of uh, machinery that you have to have on your rover. Now, so what, but what I liked about it, in fact, is we made an announcement, I think it was back in 2004, perhaps, and we did it on uh, the 8th of March. 8th of March is the uh, International Women's Day. So we dedicated those flowers to, uh, to the women that, that worked uh, uh, on our team. In fact, uh, the, most of it, it was thanks to, uh, to, to them. Um, and, and it was back in the people in, in science uh, journal, they really like, liked it. OK, let me share some, exp some uh, the results with, with you. And, uh, um, uh, because we, you have to see what was essentially the outcome of, of, of the, this uh, $3 million flight that, that we took. So uh, uh, look, uh, please ig ignore 
um, ignore all those other things uh, that you see. We're going to focus only on something that is uh, important here now. So those curves up there, they show uh, when, when they go up, it means that the ignition happens, that the process starts. When they stabilize, it means, like here or there, it means that the process has ended. What I'm showing here is, is how aluminum mixed with CO2, how they reacted. So let's first pay attention to the top and then I comment a little bit about the bottom. So we're going to focus only on this N38, which is the green line, and it represents the behavior of nanoparticles. And then this U11, it rep which is down here, it represents the behavior of uh, micro particles. So, look, you can see that uh, essentially the entire process, oxidation process, oxidation is essentially combustion. So what it means is that we mixed it and we finished everything for nano particles at 800 degree, while in the case of micron, it, it was 1100, 300 degree C, it's a substantial, it's a dramatic difference, by the way. What it means is that you have to provide so much energy that in order to bring the system up to 1100, and that energy could be used towards uh, something else, such as a uh, takeoff, for example. So uh, that, that, that was, uh, it was a tremendous uh, di difference. By the way, I'm, I'm really simplifying here. If my colleagues were, were, were here, they would accuse me of being a, 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 a semi-scientific or, or, or so. <laughs> but after all, it is a public lecture. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm just focusing on the outcomes. Now the bottom is interesting because the bottom uh, curves, they show if they go up here, that it means that there is an exothermic reaction. Exothermic reaction means that when one thing reacts with the other, it generates energy. If the peak is down, then it's a, it is an endothermic reaction, which means that in order when you mix one substance with another, in order for the reaction to take place, you have to supply energy. So we, we want those peaks up, by the way. Uh, so if you look at... Uh, uh, so aluminum at 660 degree, then there, there is a transforma natural transformation of aluminum. It would, it would change from one form to another. In our case, with uh, nano, you see that uh, like this one is nano 45, or with 38, nano 38. We had those peaks even before aluminum transferred into a different... Uh, stadium in a different state, different form. So uh, it was very good because what it meant is that we were able to initiate this process much, much earlier. With regards to micron, well, uh, this exothermic process would not begin, um, in the majority of it, would not, would not begin until 1048. So it's a tremendous difference, very, very, very much so. Now, then what we wanted to do is understand it, why is it? That's the key question in science. Why? What is the mechanism? What triggers it? What, so we, we, we've taken some uh, images with microscopes. This, this was taken with uh, transmission electron microscope. When you deal with very small <coughs> substances, and by the way, it was several years ago, then we, you didn't have a powerful enough transmission electron microscopes. Those are the microscopes that allow you now to see uh, as small a, uh, an element as perhaps a fraction of angstrom. Would it be right, Terry, to say that it's a, it's a fraction of angstrom that you can see? You can, right. So you can see atoms. Uh, now, so, but what we realized, if you have the particles, those nanoparticles, a lot of them, uh, the, those are, by the way, uh, it's a three-dimensional, so there's a lot of buildup. But if you look at individuals, we were able to find out that what happens with nanoparticles uh, is that they have a very substantial uh, 
um, ignition that occurs within the particle, not on the surface, within the particle. So it's much hotter down there than it is on the surface. While with the uh, micron, it was different. The micron, the, the CO2, uh, when attacked, it did not go th easily through the uh, surface. It would rather cause collapse of the external structure. That's why it was taking much longer. And or it would simply, um, uh, it would simply eliminate parts of the, uh, the particles. So it was a completely different process. The different process re leads to different uh, results. And we, we did some extra experiments. I, I will not, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this except to sh showing you that we did on the zero gravity flight, we utilize, uh, use uh, liquid aluminum and so on. But the key is here. So what we did is we compared our results with results of our colleagues uh, with regards to aluminum. When aluminum was um, mixed with air, uh, then the temperature that the, our colleagues were able to achieve, it was around 3,000. The other team used, uh, used uh, essentially, it, it was not air per se, but it's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. The reality is that that's what air, but if you, if you mix them separately, they behave differently. So they achieved higher. But, but we were really able to be there at 3,000 uh, degrees C. 3,000 degrees C, well, it would, uh, if we had a 3,000 degrees C and we had uh, this mouse or a, a presenter uh, and put it in there, it would take likely just a fraction of uh, milliseconds to decompose it uh, to um, individual atoms. So it's, uh, it's a very powerful technique. We've got, we were able to prove that uh, we are able to achieve temperatures that are required in order to uh, um, in order to uh, uh, initiate the uh, ignition and sustain it. And we were able to identify the conditions, uh, not only temperature, um, but, but also the, a variety of other uh, parameters that I'm not talking about today that, that uh, allowed us to uh, um, propose, ultimately, a mechanism to uh, uh, implement it. Now, so what we, what we were able to prove, in fact, quantitatively. In science, there's a difference between your ideas and the qualitative uh, expectation and the quantitative, um, uh, uh, quantitative measurement. So we were able to, to do so. We were able to prove the differences. And we were able to find out um, what is it that is needed in order for this process to uh, take place. And what we were able to do is really show uh, that those nano aluminum and nano magnesium uh, are very, very good fuels for uh, space exploration um, applications. So uh, it, it was successful. And then our colleagues took it to, to there was another iteration. And, and uh, now it is very, very likely that we're going to have um, the elements of this idea implemented in uh, 2018 in the next uh, um, in the next trip to Mars that uh, European Space Agency hopefully with the Canadian Space Agency is going to is going to implement now so uh, you see I I created together with our colleagues we created this new uh, school of engineering here, La Sonne School of Engineering. It's our baby. So, uh, uh, and we created it uh, very quickly. I mean, we initially, um, when we proposed it, and, and colleagues told us that, you, you see, at York, we have a, we ha we, we, we have a, um, a very specific culture. It's going to take a long time, maybe 2015, or maybe even later, and then, uh, and uh, I said, look, it's a, we have a uh, the culture in academia. It's a dynamic thing. So I, I, I told my colleagues that, that, look, if we have a good idea, what we have to do is we have to reach out to our colleagues. And we have to, but on the other hand, we, we know that we have collegial processes. And, but we have to make it clear that we are prepared to discuss things for as long as reasonable. 
rather than for as long as possible. <laughs> and, and then, and then we, we have to, uh, and then we have to uh, make a decision, take responsibility for it, and, and try to implement it. So uh, we essentially started this process formally when uh, we announced uh, the donation from Pierre Lasson, that, that he, he gave us $25 million, which we now multiplied several times, um, thanks to, to the university and also government and so on. Um, so it took us eight months, essentially, to create this new faculty. And uh, also, at the same time, we, we kind of we created another new faculty, Faculty of Science, as well. Uh, what mattered to us, it was uh, to make sure that we're going to do it with class and in style. Uh, because at the end, uh, after that, we will all be living in, in the same offices, under the same campus, and, and to, so it mattered to us to make sure that we will be able to do it in a unanimous fashion. And thus far, that's, what, that's how it's happening. Uh, and uh, getting a unanimous vote on the floor of Senate, it's not very easy. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sure Mickey would, tell, would attest that it is not. So look, what we created, and we didn't want to create uh, the same kind of, uh, sort of, school as, uh, as our friends in downtown at, at uh, U of T or, or, or Waterloo or, or McGill or, or Alberta and so on. We wanted to have something different and we had an opportunity to do so because we are in the process of hiring 70, 70 new faculty members and around 40 new technical staff and, uh, and administrative staff. It's a tremendous expansion. We're going to grow our student number by uh, 1,500. So if you hire new people, uh, you, we had new ideas about engineering. We asked our colleagues in, in, in the industry, what is it that they would like to, uh, how uh, engineering uh, profession is changing? What are the key characteristics of an engineer in 2020, 2030. And people really wanted somebody that will be able to understand more than just science and engineering. Somebody that will be able to understand the main cultures and religions in the world. Somebody that, that speaks more than one language. I mean, in Canada, it's not a problem per se, but, but it's, it, it's important. But when I say speak one, more than one language, it means that we want to send people abroad for one semester, compulsory. Because what you do is you will be able to see what others have to offer. You will be able to learn about their customs and, and cultures. And, and then, so you will be a, 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 a more a fuller hum, human being. I'm, I, perhaps it's a wrong word, but, but nevertheless, it, I'm sure you understand that it, 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 is, it will be somebody that, that truly will be able to function in one's uh, environment. So we designed such a program, we call it the Renaissance Engineering. And we, as you see, we trademarked it, <laughs> just in case. So uh, we trademarked it to Renaissance Engineering and Renaissance Engineers. So, uh, so we, that, that's what we did. Uh, in the background you can see that this is a uh, painting uh, by uh, Jean-Paul uh, Riopelle. Uh, he was a, a Quebec painter, and, and uh, Pierre uh, is uh, uh, collecting his works. Those of you who had an opportunity to visit him in his house, he, he's got uh, uh, many of those, uh, tens of those. Some of them are as big, perhaps bigger than this projection. So if you go to some of the locations, you feel it's, a, it's a, like a psychedelic experience, <laughs> so to speak. But it's beauty at the same time. So uh, now how we did it, uh, it's, uh, we decided to do it based on, on the partnership. And it's a variety of partnerships, but the key partnership for us is to create a partnership between the three professional schools on campus. So we have La Sonde, we have uh, Schulich School of Business and, and Osgood Hall. Um, so what the, this curriculum, what we really want to do, we say, we want to make sure that our students, uh, they have a, a truly entrepreneurial background. So when they graduate, they are not just going to 
look for a job or seek jobs. They will be able to create jobs. We want to graduate uh, entrepreneurial engineers with a social conscience. The social consciousness is important to us, and, and York is, in fact, very well prepared to, to do so, uh, to uh, provide such an education, because we have very strong uh, humanities and social sciences. Osgood, we, we are uh, creating this partnership because we want our colleagues, our students, to understand the principles of uh, leadership, what the meaning of professional integrity and ethics, and our colleagues in, in, at Osgood, we, we are certain will be able to help us doing so. So that's what we're doing. Now, when you have this new project, it's important also to have a space to deliver this new kind of uh, curriculum. Well, so this is going to be the building that we're going to host in. <laughs> We, we can't share with you crisp drawings as yet, because they are in the final stages. But uh, you, you see, that's the building. It will be located, uh, will be located next, overseeing the pond and the Black Creek Valley. It's, uh, it's a, the, the best real estate on, on campus <laughs> that we were able to, well, to, to get, we believe. And it is a little bit on a, on a hill, so we call it, we used to call it an engineering acropolis. <laughs> but people brought up with us that acropolis is falling apart. <laughs> so uh, so, so we, we're not doing it uh, anymore. But uh, uh, just to let you know, it, it's, so we, there was a competition where we hired a very skillful group of people, architects from Edinburgh. And, uh, and, and they, they came to us, we rejected their fa first five designs. And it, they, they, they were a bit, un they, were, they were too orthodox for us. Uh, it's, it's another building. Uh, what we told them is that we want this building to be um, an iconic building on campus. We have an opportunity to, to do so. And, and we said that we wanted this to reflect on nature. nature in nature, you seldom have straight angles. I mean, humans, we create strength, straight angles because it's easy, but nature is, is not. So, uh, and we told them as well, look, the reality is that the beauty is always in imperfection. It's nothing wrong having something that is not totally perfect, perfect or flashy or, or so. So we, we asked them to do so and they came up with this idea of a cloud. It, it has some meaning to us because we are embracing cloud computing and, and so on. So it, it is the, cl the cloud is the one that we will be using. And uh, I want to leave some time for questions. So, so uh, we will be delivering, by the way, our curriculum differently. It's, we are flipping the classroom concept. You see, currently, how engineering very likely other uh, uh, other curricula, curricula, how they are delivered is that you have a, you have a professor and, uh, and then you have what, 200 or 300 students listening to one's lecture. Like you're listening to me, although this is not a lecture. This is just, a, we're doing it for the fun of it. Not all of the lectures are for the fun of it. <laughs> now, now, so, so look, so that's what you do. You have a prof and a, lot, and a lot of students, they listen, and then what they, they take lecture, they go home and they solve problems, either together with others or alone. It is, in my opinion, it is suboptimal solution. Why so? Because there's so much terrific content available now online. Uh, so what we, what we did is we reached out last year to our colleagues um, uh, at MIT. They created a company called edX. Um, well, so what we said, look, why don't we try to um, experiment and, and make sure that our students then would take lectures, those uh, delivered by MIT, good, good professors, uh, good lecturers. Uh, they could take lectures wherever they are, at home, on the bus, in the cafeteria. They can take it several times and so on. When they come to the university, we want them to focus on solving problems in smaller groups with professors, around 20 or so, 
We want them to, uh, we want to teach them more about uh, creativity, um, uh, professional integrity, ethics, how to analyze things, how to synthesize things. So it will be a different kind of a delivery of the curriculum. And students liked it. So we, we did that and what we did is we designed this building exactly to reflect on this new type of delivery of our curriculum. We don't have big lecture halls. I, so I told them it's, it's, it's useless. 600 body lecture hall and, and, and then it, it's not fulfilling the educational mission very well and then it, it's, it stays empty for quite a lot quite a substantial periods of time. So we, we did that and uh, it, it, it's a, a little unfortunate because we wanted, I really wanted us, uh, us being York, to be the first one to sign a formal agreement with uh, edX, but, uh, but, but, but it took uh, lo longer than, than we anticipated at the university level to actually get this going. So, so our colleagues from uh, uh, McGill and U of T announced on Friday that uh, they signed this first agreement. Uh, right, I, I don't like to be the, the second because uh, I, I prefer to be first, except that we can claim that the Lasson School um, ha reached the first agreement uh, um, of a Canadian f academic unit with, with edX, which we did last fall, but what uh, but but they, they really want to announce partnerships with universities, not with individual faculties. So, so uh, hopefully, hopefully there will be uh, s some consensus reached uh, by the university that, that we're going to have this uh, edX uh, agreement signed. Uh, it's too bad that, we, we, that Mickey is not anymore on, on, on the board. I would lobby him to try to <laughs> get, this, get this done. OK, look, so that's the lecture. Uh, that, I mean, that, that's the presentation that, that I gave. The, for those of you who are interested more in science uh, and, and so on, one of the people that used to work with us, we have a, the, the only uh, science, space, science, uh, space uh, engineering program in Canada. Uh, Marc Garneau is coming to, to us to uh, speak uh, about science and engineering space exploration. Uh, I'm quite certain that he's going to speak a little bit about politics since he's, <laughs> he, he's, running, he's running for the, for the le leadership, but, but we want to make sure it, it's an apolitical, uh, <laughs> apolitical event. Uh, he is coming as, as a colleague and a friend of some of our uh, new professors. Um, so if you're interested, uh, there will be an announcement uh, on, on Monday at the university website. So uh, that's that. Thank you so very much for your attention and your patience. <laughs>